I'm, uh, I'm Adam Sawyer. Uh, by trade, I'm an information systems uh, security officer. I used to do a Mac build, Windows builds, and I worked with Eric to uh, try to iron out a better method for migrating uh, Windows users to Macs. I am not a Mac administrator, but I am an admin from a Mac. And I am adam.sawyer at jhuapl.edu. I'm Eric Benfer. Um, I'm the uh, Macintosh Services Manager for, the, for APL's IT department. Um, I like to say that I have the best job in the world. I get to manage APL technology for the lab. And um, I'm eric.benfer and, and eric at benfer.com. Ooh. Oh, crap. Dagger. Do you, is that working? Yeah, I think so. Do you got it? Try. Try. All right. Maybe. Ah. There we go. Yeah. All right. Okay. So, um, <laughs> so we love questions. Feel free to ask questions along the way. So many of you in here trying not yes, to that's right. raise your hand or something. We may need to steer it back on track, but uh, we do love questions along the way. Uh, so another just a uh, little baseline for what we were what we do for management tools. Um, we use Semantic AV on our Macs. Um, we bind our Macs to Active Directory for authentica authentication and, and login and everything. Um, we use CrashPlan for backup, good stuff. And we use Casper to manage it all. So what we're gonna be talking about is effective strategies for migrating from Windows clients to Mac clients. And in our experience, this, you know, a good strategy involves at automating as much of the process as possible. What you can't automate, document. Document, document, document. And not so much a technical requirement, but you really wanna set the expectations of your clients properly. So people migrating from Windows to Mac, you wanna let them know what's gonna work, what's not gonna work. So this is the more detailed agenda. Uh, you guys can read that, I'm not gonna read it to you. But we're, we're gonna go through, you know, automating your Mac builds, you gotta determine your requirements, we'll show you how we determined our requirements. I'm gonna go after the easiest thing first, set the switcher's expectation again. I'm gonna do some information on uh, the Windows prep size side. Uh, some things we looked into on how to capture Windows data, how we migrate the data to the Mac, and then the easiest part, which is delivery, setup, and. So why, why, why are we doing this? Why would we choose to uh, put effort into this? Well, for us, this is the reason why. Uh, for years, APL had about 400 so Macs, uh, 4,700 employees, so about 400 so Macs, and in 2008, when Apple went to Intel, those numbers started to climb. So I have a very accurate count here. Starting in January 2009, we had 500. Now we're up almost to 1,300. So, and it's a, as you can see, it's a very nice progressive, uh, you know, up, up, up. And it doesn't show signs of stopping. And also, sorry, <laughs> also, Above that 500 mark, you know, we had that four, level of 400 systems or so. Those were all Mac users. They had always been Mac users. They, they continued to be Mac users. Above 500, you know, nearly every one of those, they switched from Windows to Mac. Now, we had some people coming in from other places or had been Mac users previously, but, you know, a lot of these are, are the majority of these are Windows to Mac switchers. So we have a few. Uh, a uh, little bit of experience with this. So, you know, where to start? Automate your Mac build. You know, this is 50% of the process. If you wanna, if you wanna put effort into this at all, automate your Mac build. So then you wanna determine your requirements, and this is literally what we did, is we pulled Different people from different groups, help desk, uh, field dispatch, the people that do the builds, uh, Eric who's on the Mac team, I was on the Windows team, and we got all together in a room and we just started writing out um, kind of what we needed to get over. Some, some big things we have are PST files, everybody loves PST files. 
um, who's, who's going to do training because most of these users are Windows, so they assume that the start menu is going to show up on their Mac too. <laughs> we have, you know, how to do S-MIME certs. Uh, we went through the Windows build and the Windows migration to see how much we could match up. And then we talked about how to move the data and uh, Eric looked at how we would get the data over and get the permissions set correctly for the user when they log in. But generally this is a pretty easy way, just get together with a bunch of people, hold them up in a room and just iron out you know, what you can do. And from this we can determine what we can automate, especially from my side, from a Windows side. You know, Eric might want something automated and I literally would just tell him, no, we, we're not going to automate that. That's, that's not going to be possible. But some of the stuff, and, and as you'll see, most of it's pretty, pretty easy to do, actually. And, you know, your whiteboard is going to look a lot different than our whiteboard. So, you know, you guys are going to have your, your requirements. These are our requirements. Um, so, you know, once you determine those requirements, you got to go after that low-hanging fruit. Um, figure out what are some of the easy things you can tackle. So the process initially is going to be manual. So it's going to be 100% manual at first. And really the first case study should just be, well, I'm sure you have transferred someone from Windows to Mac. Well, when you did it manually, what did you do? What are you migrating by hand? And that's kind of the easiest way. Just start writing down what do the people want? Do they want their bookmarks? They want to know where the applications are at, share drives, that kind of thing. And in the end, what you really have to do is just make sure the user understands things are going to be different on the other side. But write down all these things that you're doing manually, and then from that on, you figure out what can be automated. Now, you guys are Mac administrators. You guys might be Windows administrators too. Not sure. Uh, or you might be both. But if you have Windows team, the best thing to do is to get with them. Some, some of this information we're going to show you is visible in a lot of inventory solutions for Windows. And the things I'm going to show you script-wise are really simple to do. You don't need to be a Windows administrator to do a lot of this stuff. So. For our, our, third pull, our third bullet point there, the, uh, you know, what are the users asking for? You, know, you, may, you may be collecting that kind of data when you go out and you help them when you set it up. You might be getting that data a month later because they've called up the help desk and they want to know, well, how do I get to my S drive or you know, things like that. Um, a real, you know, nothing technical here, but you want to set their expectations, you know. It, I got a couple of lumps of carbon here, right? There's no difference here, right? It's the same thing. You know, there's, there's a big difference. Um, this is as important as all the technical aspects. Um, and when you set it, set it again correctly. So one of the things that we've done is we have, we have knowledge documents, knowledge articles. And this knowledge article, we, this is pulled directly from one of our knowledge articles. You know, we hope the users are getting this information prior to them buying that Mac. And, you know, once they bought that Mac, that's money that's been spent and you know, they don't want to throw it away. They certainly don't want to give it away. So I mean, we, we literally asked the question, should I get a Mac at APL? Uh, we don't, great option for some people. Yeah, for other, other people, it's just not. And, you know, forgive the eye chart here, don't focus on what, you know, on the specifics here, but, you know, we kind of went into it twofold. We did deal breakers and we did, and then we did considerations. So, we had three deal breakers. One of them was something called RMIS. Um, which is a plug-in for Excel that only runs on Windows. And so if you're, if you're one of the uh, people who deals with money and, and, uh, and time and things like that, m maybe it's not such a great idea for you. Um, Internet Explorer, you know, there's just some web pages that still use ActiveX and still need Internet Explorer. Um, we deal with, uh, we deal with uh, DOD CAC cards. Um, that's redundant, but DOD CAC or smart cards. Uh, so there are some, you can use those on Macs, but again, some of those pages that you would go to are IE only, so. And business apps, you know, if you're a big organization, you may have business apps and just, you know, frequently they're running on this old legacy stuff and it's just Windows only. So again, these, if you, if you're, as I say, if your job relies on the APL business apps, no, it's just gonna, you're going to have a pain 
by switching over to a Mac. Just stick with a PC at that point. Then we had some considerations. Um, uh, what programs do you use? You know, the, the, and this is you know, this knowledge document is talking to the the end user. What programs do you use every day? Is there? It does it also run on the Mac? You know, Word, PowerPoint, Excel. Okay, yeah, we know that runs on the Mac. But what about ABC program? Well, better go to the go to the user's web, the manufacturer's website, and see is there a Mac version or is there some other alternative? So do some homework. Um, virtual machines. It's it's uh, virtual machines are a great solution. You know, the Mac is very flexible. I can run. Windows, I can run Mac, I can run Linux, but if the first thing I do, or the first thing I plan to do, is open a Windows virtual machine to use all day long, yeah, I probably could have saved my organization a couple hundred bucks and gotten a generic beige box. Uh, SharePoint is another consideration. <laughs> SharePoint has gotten better. <laughs> yes, I actually said that. I actually said SharePoint <laughs> has gotten better. When you go from SharePoint 2007, I, I'm, yeah, yeah so. 2007 to 2010, that's a step forward. When you go from Office on the Mac 2008 to Office 2011, that also gets better. So right now, Office 2011 and SharePoint 2010, that's kind of the, the best combination there. And there's also the... Microsoft Document Connection app built into Office now. That's a really good way to, to interact with any files that you have on a SharePoint site. And PSTs. Yay, PSTs. Anybody have to deal with PSTs here? Yeah. What, what's, what's your record? How many? I know you've got a user who had a bunch of PST files. What, what's the record? Anybody? No, not the largest, but just they had they had a boatload of PST files. Twelve. Wow. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we. I, I wish they I, only had twelve. Fifty-seven was my record. <laughs> I, I didn't have fifty-seven, but I had a user who had fifty-seven, and we recently had to deal with somebody, uh, not for a migration, but somebody had a hundred and two PST files. It, you know, you, you there are some users who. They have to keep a record of every single communication that they've ever had. And, you know, what are you going to do? That, that's just what they have to do. But those are considerations. Yes, we can pull those PST files into Outlook 2011 now. That's fantastic. Uh, on, our white, on our whiteboard, that, that was a couple years ago. We didn't have a way to deal with PST files at that point. It was a big question mark. Um, we, did some things, we'd put it on a terminal server or we'd access it through a VM and just, you know, we didn't have a great solution. We have a really good solution now with Outlook 2011, but remember that PST file has to be 2003 format or newer. And once it's in Outlook, it's no longer a PST file. So if you've got somebody thinking they're gonna put it on a shared drive and access it from their Mac and from a PC, that it, that's not gonna happen. So. We're prepping Windows here, so. <laughs> so the first step is to go to the Windows box. Yeah. And um, <laughs> I do like that. So obviously you need to let the user know. There's, there's differences. Users don't realize that you know, Mac OS X is completely different than Windows XP. So there's some things that we can't fully automate. So it requires interaction from us, interaction from the help desk. Some of the things, the information you want to gather from the Windows machine is tied to their local profile. So they're the logged on user. That's the information I want to get. So there is some things that you have to do. But the end goal is to get all of this data that they have on their Windows machine, move it into a predictable location that's accessible to the Mac, and then move it over. And our goal in the end is to not tie up both machines at the same time. So we'll do our best to let them have their Windows machine and we'll move data and then we'll have their Mac built, we'll deliver it, but they still have a machine to use because they don't have a machine to use, then they're and just unhappy. Th this is another one of our knowledge documents. We're all about documenting what we can't automate. Document, document. If you have to do it more than two times and you can't automate it, you better document it. So this is right from our knowledge document that the help desk uses, um, kind of the intro, and then we get into... Uh, 
you know, the first steps of the Windows prep. Right, so what our help desk does is I created a, a VBS script and they run this Windows source press script, prep script. It grabs sort of this information, it grabs a couple other things too. The sky's the limit on what you wanna get though. VBS is a very well-known language. The Google machine knows well about it. People write things all the time. Um, you, could, you could cookie cut VBS into most processes. So what we do though, for example, we create this report that lists the user's printers, their drive mappings, uh, full paths of shortcuts on the desktop, installed programs, and we move it into a text file that we could use uh, later on. Uh, but Adam, why would you want to get the uh, path of a, of a link on the desktop? Right, so users, they, they don't get that the, um, the S drive is not really S. There's no S drive on our network. So if they have a document to the S drive on their desktop and it's a link, they move over to their Mac and they're like, where is my weekly report document? Oh, where was it? Oh, it was on the S drive. Where is the S drive? Well, you're supposed to know where the S drive is at. So. That's why we, uh, we, we want to see where the links are going. That's why we also grab map drives so that when we move them over to the Mac, we can link all that back up for them. Um, number two is something you could, you could automate. Number three is something you can automate too. We don't automate it right now, just on a basis of effort, but we export the web browser bookmarks. Adam, when are you gonna have that done for me? Yes. Hmm? Hmm? Soon. Okay. So we export them. And the other thing too is from a, from a Windows perspective, I don't know if they're running you know, Firefox, or if they're running Netscape, you believe it, or if they're running Internet Explorer, so the whole, the whole lot of underground, underlining code that would go into getting all these. So we just ask the user, well, what browser do you use? And then you export them. A big one for us is we, we use a lot of VeriSign certificates, DOD certificates, so we want to make sure we don't lose those, because that's a painful process to get back from VeriSign again, and it, it costs money, so. You know, and again, this is, this is, this is us. This is, this is what we do. You guys are going to have something more important. You need that widget. That I need to know all about that widget. So get your, you know, either automate that part or document it. And again, I'm not doing. I'm I'm the I'm the service manager. I don't have to do these dirty things. Yet. No, um, I, that's true. The help desk does this process. They walk through it with the with the user. Um, a lot of these steps and and some of these scripts. We're actually moving over on the Windows to Windows process because they're finding that, oh, this actually just makes it a little more efficient. We're cleaning up. We're cleaning up the Windows system prior to migrating it. So they're thinking about doing that on the Windows side as well. Two, uh, two other steps. Um, these are my favorite steps. You know, they're just so easy. You know, step four, you just identify and move all the user data into my documents. You know, that's easy. How hard could that be? Um, I hear that Windows users like to put things all over the place. Um, yeah, yeah, all on the desktop or the C drive or yeah. wherever. All, or their S drive or, you know. Ten. Uh, again, you know. Because they're working files. We're automating things. We're trying to automate things. Automation means predict you can automate things when it's predictable. So if I put everything, all their files, all their whatnot, into their desktop or they're my documents or, you know, in their home directory. Of course, now Windows, Windows 7 has slash users, so <laughs> it's not kind of familiar. So get it all in their home directory. Um, so like I say here, you know, talking to the help desk here, use your expertise and best judgment. And this is, again, while they're working with the user at this point. So we're moving it all into their home directory. Uh, which is really great on the Mac. Yes? Have you guys tried migration assistant at all? We're going to get to that. Okay. We're going to get to that. That's, that's good, though. That's good. Um, and then number five, you know, PST files. Yeah, just, you know, just organize, identify, and consolidate all the PST files. Yeah, that's, you know, that's easy. <laughs> that's the part that that can just take a long time. In our environment, yet we do, we are an exchange shop. In our environment, we have quotas. So some users choose to get, choose to deal with the quotas by copying things locally into a PST file. And okay. But, you know, it used to be if your PST file went over two gigs, 
it would get corrupted. It was it wasn't yeah. if it would get it would get it would get corrupted. Yeah. Um, so now that with the 2003 format that got better, you can you can get larger PST files. But you know if if they've got lots of them and anybody know the default location for a PST file? Anybody? I know Adam does. Documents and settings, local settings. Is it yeah, it's 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 way down in some crazy folder. Yeah. It's down there. yeah. <laughs> okay, so I'm just. These are some ways you guys could do it. Again, Mac, Mac administrators, but that's fine. So we we use Visual Basic scripting, VB script, VBS. Um, we utilize the Windows Management Instrumental WMI. We do some WMI calls inside of VBS, but. You can also use WMI directly. It's really fun. You could go old school with it and you can make a batch file. Uh, you could use PowerShell or PowerScript. Um, or you could just do all of this manually. So you could just use Windows Explorer, move data around, write down the applications that are installed from Atom Root programs, write down the map drives. Just make sure you document it, put it somewhere safe. So <clears throat> one day, a couple years ago, I'm thinking about how to do this because we're getting a lot of requests for this, you know. We're doing these things manually. Popped into Adam's office, sat down. He and I started talking. Adam's on the Windows team. Um, I'm on the Mac team. You can get along with your Windows counterparts. <laughs> Bring Barely. them in. Bring them in early on in the process. When you're, when you're doing the whiteboard, they need to be there for that whiteboard session. You need, you need the Windows guys to help you with the Windows side. So. You know, bring them in, buy them a beer, whatever it takes. That works well. Yeah. <laughs> so this is, uh, this is this, just a little video I, we did. It's just, uh, I'm basically going to run a couple of the scripts that we use. I'll show you the code. It's pretty easy. This one's just going to give me the map drives real quick. Uh, this is on my box. I only had two map drives. It just kind of tells you where the map drive is. Again, the user's not going to really know. Clearing the screen. Then we'll run another one. We run all of these in the command prompt. Uh, this is just as an example. You see script to call it, and uh, this is going to give me the user's desktop items here. So what it'll do is it's going to look for only links. It doesn't care about files that are actually on the desktop because those are really there. So it's going to tell me that this file points to you know, the U drive, or this file, this file points to you know, my downloads, so that we can kind of link those up for the people on the other end on the Mac. I think this final one. This one gets printers, so uh, you got five printers attached. It'll tell me if it's local, it'll tell me if it's remote. Uh, that can be helpful because users usually forget that they have a local printer. They actually need to get it installed before they can actually use it. It's fun. I think I might have one more. Yeah. So this one just finds specific files. We have some file types that we like to keep track of. We like to move over for users. Um, it's not automated. So basically, you can look for any file you want. I said I made some fake .mac files, and I said I put them in various locations. They use WMI to do a search on the desktop for it. and Just tell me where all those .mac files are. And you guys might have other files that are specific to you. We do have files that we need to grab. So this is kind of a usefulness for that. And these are just, we, we've made this process modular. So these, this is an example of some of the modular things, and then we combine them into one script that you know, get, gets put on the user's desktop and you double click it, and we'll have an example of that. Yep. So, and I just, again, I know Mac administrators, I get it. Um, this, is, this is VBS. This is just showing you, this is a, a really short amount of code. This is nine lines of code. This grabs the, uh, the user's map drives. Um, this is it with comments. I'm not going to explain how VBS works, but quickly all you really do is you create some variables and then you set those variables to certain objects. Like we have a wscript.network object that allows us to look at networking type things. Then we set a collection of drives. We say to enumerate all of the network drives. And then we have a, a loop that just says go through each one of these network drives, tell me what the letter is, and tell me where it's mapped to. We have, we're going to have all these scripts. I, we've got a link. Uh, uh, later on, and um, you can download all these scripts. We've got some Apple scripts also that help that help to automate it. They're all in the uh, in, on the last page. Yep. Uh, this is one for the desktop links. So we try to show you the ones that I did. Uh, again, this is only this is 14 lines of code. takes a, takes a little bit more time. This is it with comments. 
Again, you do the same thing. You create variables, you set objects, you enumerate the objects, and then you just go through each one. And a lot of this stuff, Chris? Um, are these going to be, um, be included in your presentation that's going to be posted later on? Hmm? Yes, and we have a link to the, yeah. to the scripts. We, we actually have like 13 or 14 of these, I think. They all do various, various things. They grab different items from the Windows box, but this stuff's really cookie cutter, kind of, uh, you really, there's so many people who write VBS script that anything you want to do, someone's already wrote it for you probably. You might need to edit it a little bit, but you just do a Google search for what you want. These are just examples. The Google machine has the your Google answer. The Google machine has, yes. <laughs> they know. This one, uh, this one wins, it's only eight lines of code. So this finds files. This actually uses the WMI, which is sort of like this underlining Windows database. and. Uh, same thing, we create variables, we set the WMI to say I'm looking at this machine. Because WMI is cool, you can do this over the network too. So you could do this to another box, it doesn't have to be this machine, but for our example it is. I set a collection of files to a, what looks to be a SQL query, where I just say select names from this database of files where the drive is C, and the extension is EPF, which is a certain type of file format we look for. And then again, for each one you find, just, just tell me where it's at. All of these echo out to the command prompt, but ours doesn't do that. Ours actually uh, writes it to a file. We included that VBS script too. I think we have an example gotcha. of that the, actually uh, next. The video. This is actually what people would do. Um, the help desk would connect to a user's machine. They would double click this uh, the VBS script. Uh, the WMI parts can take a little bit longer. This one actually is gonna go through and it's gonna give me a collection of software that's installed also. I think this is software and map drives, desktop links, and I think I've put an example of how to get environmental variables out, just in case they have licensed software that's pointing at specific places and you need to figure that out. I think we do, we also do all of the apps that are installed on their Windows box, so later mm -hmm. on they go, hey, where's such and such app? Yep, so then it creates this Windows inventory text file on the bottom. It, you can format this any way you want. You could be really slick with it. You can make this HTML if you wanted to. But here you go, it's uh, current software install, location of .Mac extension files, map drives, environmental variables. So we, we do a lot more than this, but this is just kind of a, kind of a simple example. And uh, the way we do it is modular, so we just have functions in one big VBS script, and we cut and paste them in and out, and then we write them out. So if someone wants to find another type of file, someone wants to know what PSTs are loaded actively in Outlook right now, or what private certificates does the user have. And these are a little bit more difficult to do, but again, Google knows how to do it. So, and basically cut it in there. This, this is part of that process that the help desk is doing for us. Yep. Um, you know, in our case, our help desk does it. They, they contact, the, you know, the users called up, said, hey, I wanna go from Windows to Mac. They schedule that when the Mac is gonna be delivered, things like that. In the meantime, they're, they're going through, they're, they're cleaning up the files, finding all the different files, putting them in the documents folder, dealing with the PST files, exporting bookmarks, um, exporting certificates so you can import them onto the Mac. Um, and then they run this script. And, this, and we've got that file. And so we, we store that file on the desktop, which we are going to be migrating over to the Mac. So upon delivery, and we'll get into delivery and setup and things like that. But upon delivery, they have this nice little report of, hey, yeah, where was all this stuff that I need to do? And again, we determine these requirements by talking to our users. You know, talking to the, figuring out what were the users calling up later? You know, oh, I can't find such and such. Well, let's write that down. Let's figure out how to automate that. Oh, I can't, I wonder how I would do this. Let's just, you know, figure that out. And, you know, the, the, the list of apps. You know, what, what were they using? Hey, I had this app that I ran once a year for this report. I don't know what it's called, but it's yeah, easy it's, to find again. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, at that, the, you know, that's six months later. So at that point, the, their PC has been surplused by then. We've already wiped that. Yeah, it's wiped, being reissued or thrown away or something. Um, but we have this. So this, this is so useful, having this record. Yeah, and you can, you can also take this and via VBS, you can send this via email if you'd like to yourself, and you can have your exchange server back it up, or if you're afraid that the user's gonna delete it, well, you just email it to a distro, and uh, again, Google will tell you how to spoof emails via VBS pretty easily, <laughs> so, and, and that's like 13 lines of code, but. 
So at this point, like I, like I was saying, you know, user decided, okay, I've read this article, I know, I know what I'm getting into, I, I hope they've read that article and they know what they're getting into. I'm going to get a Mac. I'm going to get that bright, shiny new MacBook Air. Um, we've worked with them. We've put things in predictable locations. We've captured this. We've exported that. That's the manual stuff. Now we want to get this data, his data, onto the new Mac. So we're going to talk about that. So we're going to talk about this. this is yeah, so we, we went through a couple, couple phases of attempting to capture this Windows data. And our initial take was, uh, all right, users put stuff all over the place. We're just going to grab a full image. We're going to grab the whole image of the Windows box, and we'll throw it on the Mac, and then three months down the later, the user can just open it themselves and find the data that they were using. On, on our Mac side, for our Mac process, um, you've got an old Mac. You're going to a new Mac. Uh, we do a snapshot of that old Mac. So we're making a disk image of the old Mac, and we're putting it on a file server, and then, when, then we use Migration Assistant. Again, this is Mac to Mac. Use Migration Assistant to pull the data over to the new Mac. That's what we do on the Mac side. We do a similar process on the Windows side. Um, so these, these are a couple of things we try. We, we use Altiris. We use Altiris Deployment Solution and the notification server. So we said, OK, well, we'll use Altiris. We'll, we'll grab a, a rapid deploy image uh, from the machine. We'll store that. But Macs can't read the format. One of our requirements was that we didn't want to have to install additional pieces of software on the Mac. So then we used Ghost, and we had Ghost make an ISO. Um, the only issue with this was that it fails every time there's a file bigger than four gigs. It didn't work well enough for us, so we decided not to go with that. Um, then we used Ghost to make a VNDK, which is a whole nother world. But uh, it, it worked, but the issue is that the systems are already old. They're four years old. So these hard drives are, are typically not in the best condition. So this VMDK would succeed, but it would also fail. And from an automation perspective, you want it to be as close to 100%. You, I don't want to have to, once I create a process, I don't want to interact with it later on and have to fix it or work with it. Yeah. So, but th this is pretty this cool, is, is though. Pretty cool, we though. we yeah. still, there's still a lot of things we like about this. We're getting the entire computer with this. Yep. And, and as a VMDK, Hey, guess what you can do with that? You can virtualize it. So, Import that right into VMware. Right into, so yeah, you know, again, it's an older system. Maybe it's having some software problems too. So yeah, but it, it, we just, we think that's pretty cool. Um, on the Mac side, when we were doing the VMDK, um, there, you know, there's a couple different tools you can use to read VMDKs. We used MacFuse, um, which, which can mount all kinds of different uh, file systems. Uh, we did run into some problems. I, had, I don't know if they've updated MacFuse to be 64-bit at this point, uh, but when we were using it, when the new Macs came out that launches 64-bit, MacFuse wouldn't run, so we'd have to reboot them and hold down, the, uh, hold down 32. Um, you can also hold down 23 if you want. <laughs> So, so what, what we use today, we use the Microsoft User State Migration Tool. I, I don't have a whole lot of experience with this one. Um, th most of this stuff we worked on a year, a year and a half ago, two years ago. I, I'm no longer over there. So this is what they use today. But they, they configure this just to get the users My Documents and Desktop, which is why we tell the help desk to move all their data to the My Documents or the desktop. And they, they use this on Windows to Windows migrations yeah. too. So this is our current tool that we like, Windows to Windows. When we do Windows to Windows, we're capturing a lot more stuff and they're compressing it into, um, I, I don't remember the, the format name, but it's a, a format proprietary to user state migration tool that Windows can read. Mac can't read that, but in this case, we're, we're we're ca capturing just the files. So we actually capture it to an area called capture no, no, capture no compress. So it's just files on a file server. So we use this. Um, and typically, we're, we're while the user is on the phone with the help desk, we're arranging for a, t for a night that they can leave their computer on. Um, you know, because a, a lot of the times it's laptop. So, oh, I got to take my laptop home with me every night. You know, it's like, Take the night off tonight. <laughs> Take the night off. Leave your computer on. Um, 
trying to remember if we went, if we asked them to be logged in or logged out. I can't I can't remember off the top of my head, but you know your mileage may vary. You know, leave the computer on. It captures all that overnight, and that's a that's a big deal. We're trying to, you know, inconvenience the users as little as possible. I don't want to take their computer from them and have them with nothing or make them have to use a loaner system or something like that. Um, really, really important here. Um, and you can't say this to the user too many times. If I capture your system on a Monday and I deliver your, Mac, your new Mac to you on a Friday, you are responsible for any new files or any changes you've made to that system because I'm using that capture from Monday, putting it on your Mac. You know, normally it's not that long. It's usually a day, you know, and we, and we get it to them. But they still need to be saving that, you know, they've got to save their doctorate thesis to their U drive or to, the, or to a U, USB stick or something like that. Of course, you know, while all this has been happening, our build team has, you know, gotten the Mac, taken it out of the box, we use Casper for our, imp, for our Mac builds. Um, you can use whatever else. Um, Casper represent. <laughs> um, you know, what it, whatever works for you. Um, but, you know, we're doing that Mac build while all this other stuff is happening. Um, again, we want to have that, that window where they don't, you know, that, that window where maybe they don't have both computers or they don't have a computer to be very small overnight if possible. Um, so now we want to get that data to the Mac. Um, again, minimize user downtime. That, that, that's, a, that's a good philosophy for no matter what you have. Um, and we prefer not to tie up both computers. You, there, there's, a, there's, there's a lot of ways to skin this cat. You know, we can put both computers in the same room and, and transfer data that way. We prefer not to tie up both computers. Um, and we, once we've gotten that Windows data, we want to pull that data onto the Mac during the build process prior to delivery. We don't want to be sitting there with the user watching a blue bar crawl across the screen. It gets really boring. Um, and what we do for that, you know, we're logged in as an admin when, during the build process while we're doing the final little bit of cleanup stuff. We just do a finder copy. It's, we mount the file server, we copy it down. Um, and, you know, if you just wanted to get started, yeah, you know, mount the C share. Copy it that way. No big deal. You know, you, there is some user downtime there, but you know, that's where you can start. You don't, you don't have to start at the finish line. <laughs> start where you can and automate what you can along the way. Um, anybody know what, what my problem with the second to last bullet is? I'm logged in as an admin and I've copied the user data's, user's data down. Yeah, who owns that? Who owns that data? Yeah, in our case, root. We're, we're logging in as root. So we do have a solution for that. I've got an Apple script that, my, that, that the build team uses um, to help clean that up. So I've got a little video of it. Um, so we've launched the Apple script. Just tells you what it's going to do. Run. I'm putting in the, user's, uh, the username that, that we're going to do. It actually creates a folder under slash users. Not not their home directory because we don't want to create an empty home directory. That would be bad. So it's a home directory with Windows transfer tagged onto it. So I've mounted the, um, the file server. I'm navigating down through the USMT and documents and settings, you know, copying these two. And it's told you to do that in that little window there. And I'm going to go in here and I'm just going to paste it. That bar may take a little bit longer when you do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so at this point, it's still owned by root. I click OK, 
it's gone in and it knew who that, who that was for, okay? And it's figured out what the permission should be and it's changed it and you can see right up here, it actually does an ls-al and shows you uh, who owns it. Um, notice it is 777 right now, okay? We still need it to be open, especially if, um, uh, especially if you're logged in as a, just an admin and not root. At, if I'm logged in as root, I can do whatever I want to, but if you're logged in as an admin and you, and you need to do this, uh, we've got it as 777. But we are going to be moving that data into the user's home directory, so that, that should clean that up. So here's the Apple script I'm using. It's just, a, it's just an Apple script. Um, so I'm displaying a dialog. What is the username? And you know, the, what's already populated in there is just username. So you know, you're, you're prompting your text to type in the, the, the user's name. Um, I'm using, all of our Macs are bound to Active Directory. So that's a, that's a key part here. We're bound to Active Directory. It can be any directory system, but you need to be bound to, to a directory system prior to doing this. I'm using the ID command. So if you type ID in your, your username, it'll give you all kinds of information about your user account. It'll tell you what your, what your UID is, what your group ID is, all the groups that you're a member of, and if you're bound to a domain, bound to a directory system, it will even display that information prior to the user logging in. So really handy. So I'm using the dash u flag to get the user ID, and I'm making that a, a variable of new Mac user, and I'm doing the same thing for the group ID. And I come down here and I'm gonna make a directory, and you know, again, 777, and with the user's name, dash windows transfer. That, that's, again, really important. I don't want to make a, I don't want to make an empty home directory for the user because they would log in. The Mac would say, oh, you've already got a home directory and it wouldn't bother to pull any of the user template over. And if you're doing a, a really good build process, you've done some stuff in the user template to set up things for the user. Um, and, um, you know, we're using the with administrator privileges because we're doing some Powerful stuff here. Uh, yeah, so we've been, and I open that, that folder. So I'm bringing it forward so the text know where to copy things. So it just opens right up for them. Um, then I tell, I tell this, app, this, this app, I tell it to you know, come back to the foreground so it's displaying, displaying that dialogue about, okay, now go into this file server and copy the data into that, that folder I just opened. You know, you could even put some more, uh, some more magic in here that would automatically mount the file server. We just have a shortcut in our root account to it. So it's displaying the dialog. You know, go ahead and manually copy that data in, and however long that takes. You know, that may be 10 seconds like here. It may be 10 hours, depending on how much data it is. Once that's done, you click OK, and it comes down in here, and it does a, it does a ch flag. All right, ch flag minus r no ouch g. That means unlock all those files. We find that we just found that there were a lot of locked files on Windows. So when we'd copy them up, just a ton of locked files. Well, I don't know. I guess it's a Windows thing. <laughs> if it's locked, I can't change. I can't change permissions or ownership. Um, so I got to unlock that file first. Then I do a chone. And again, I'm using the UID and the group ID, and then that's it. So we've, we've set it up. The user hasn't logged in. I haven't bothered the user yet. This is all happening down in our build room. It's just all their data is on there now. And it's properly owned. So we have uh, some delivery setup and a bunch of other stuff. So you bring the system to their office, you plunk it down on the table, you plug a bunch of cables into it, and you have the user log in. You know, th this is no different than if it was just, hey, here's a new user getting a new computer. So they log in, you go through whatever normal setup stuff you do on a Mac. Connect to Outlook, 
show them where different file servers are, whatever, this, whatever the stuff you normally do, go ahead and do that stuff. Um, move their data into their home directory. They'll, they'll be able to get to it. They own it. They own that folder. They'll be able to get there, but you must move that data because otherwise it's just 777. Everybody can read it. So we got to get that data in there. Then you throw away, the, throw away that folder because that folder is not needed anymore. Right, so then after you move the data over, this is the time where you sit with the user and you try to help them remember things that they forgot, like where their map drives are, that they don't have any printers anymore, uh, where their shortcuts are at. You Where's my S drive? Always, always need their S drive. Import the PSTs in minutes. Um, set up SMIME as needed. And the nice thing, though, is you have this record. So down the line, and it's going to happen down the line, is this user is going to have forgotten that they need something. And instead of just telling them that they're stuck, at least you have something to reference from their old Windows machine. Try to help them out. But the nice thing with this, too, is that by utilizing this Windows inventory file, if we do all of this for them, our hope is that they don't have to call our help desk. They don't need more assistance. They don't say that moving to the Mac was a horrible experience. They, they don't have any more downtime than we've already, you know, more or less caused for them. But that's a perfect world, so obviously there's still things that yeah. they need help with. Probably they need help on how to use a Mac because yeah. they're usually Windows users. So and that's, that's, that's the easy part. That's actually still something that is <laughs> in discussion forever for us is who is responsible for training the user? I mean, that, that's an open question to, to everybody in this room. Who is responsible for your organization? Who is responsible for training the user how to use a computer? I mean, w are, would you expect, you know, would, would a new user to your company expect to be trained on how to use Windows? Uh, you know, should they expect to be trained on how to use OS X? Uh, you know, th there, there's many, many ways to think about it. You know, if we're training them, at least we're training them in what we, ex what we want them to know. If we're not training them, they're figuring it out somehow. Is there a productivity? You know, wh where's, the, where's, the, uh, where's that curve where it's more valuable to train them to, than not to train them? Um, but at the very least, again, documentation, documentation, documentation. We have these, we have 411 sites. VPN 411, Mac 411, these are all on our intranet. Um, and you know, we just say, yeah, here's, here's a document on how to connect to network shares. Here's a document on how to configure Outlook, you know, anything like that. Write it down, make it accessible to your users. You know, you don't want them calling the help desk. Maybe you do. Actually, yeah, you might. Yeah. Then, yeah. In the end, the person who's dropping their Mac off, yeah, that's the teacher. I mean, so you need to also teach the teacher. So you got to teach that person who's dropping it off. Ha make sure they know how to use a Mac. Even if they're not a Mac person, you want to, you know, hey, yeah, that's a DVI plug, that's a, that's a mini display port, you know, make sure they're not breaking anything, you know, just make sure to at least teach them how to use a Mac. Hey, what about Migration Assistant? Yeah. <laughs> Adam, what about Migration Assistant? Migration Assistant is awesome. Um, we use Active Directory. Migration Assistant can't move over Active Directory accounts. So we, we, we use it in a lab. We, we tested it out. Of course, we, we, we've done all this. And Stop. So, no. Someone was like, well, what about that migration tool they just released? And I was like, great. We did all this. And they made a tool for it. So immediately we went to a lab. We hooked some machines up. We're like, all right, let's see how this works. And we found out pretty quickly that it doesn't do Active Directory accounts. It, it only works within the same network segment. That may not be an issue for, for, for you guys. It, and it ties up both computers. So it really, really does. Really ties you're, up you're both computers. You're maxed on. It's, it's, oh, we're going to close all the applications for you. Yeah, whatever. Oh, no, you really did. You really just closed everything. And it just sits at, so the amount of time it takes. And the Windows box is kind of unusable, too, because 
it's running at 100% disk usage that, usually. That, that's, that was the deal for us, breaker for right. us. You know, this stuff, it's just, you know, you can get around this just by scheduling and coordinating things. Um, oh, hey, I'm going to be gone for a week. Perfect. We're going to take your computer and we're going to plug it in and make it happen. But, yeah. It worked. But yeah. Um, a funny thing. So Migration Assistant will do bookmarks also. It'll do Safari bookmarks. So Windows Safari bookmarks. But it's not as silly as it sounds because if you load Safari, one of the first things it wants to do is import your bookmarks. So, okay, that's just a, that's just a process. That's just part of the process. Before you do this, if you're using Migration Assistant, make sure to load Safari, open up, and import those bookmarks. And this will take care of it for you. So, um, it, I, I can, I can kind of look over the horizon and, and maybe, maybe this goes away. Maybe that, that goes away and works for us. Yeah. So, we do, have, we do still have some gotchas. This is, this is the big one. Yeah, this is the major one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> ooh, ooh, MacBook Air, I gotta have that. I gotta have that, I gotta have that. I, I got one, I love it, you know. <laughs> so. it, it's, we, it's still a problem for us. They, they jump, they haven't checked it out. They've read that article after they got their Mac. Um, and, you know, they say, Ah, oh, but I got to use RMIS. Okay. You got to use RMIS. The only way for it to use RMIS on a Mac is a Windows virtual machine. So be prepared to start supporting more Windows boxes as you get more Macs. I saw you guys going to be We, we, have, we have a process for Windows Virtual Machines. Um, uh, we use Altiris for, for managing our, our, our physical machines. We use Altiris for managing our virtual machines. We actually build our virtual machines using the same process that we build our physical machines. Yeah. So it's not a giant deal that a user requests the for, VM. For the Mac admin, it's not a big deal. <laughs> it's for, no for problem for us. For the Windows admin, it is, though. Be yeah, we, we, we don't want two OSs on the box. I, we, yeah. we, we don't support dual booting. And yeah, exactly. It's increasing the PC count. Yeah. So, I'm happy Windows user wants to go to a Mac. Good. One less for me. Yeah. And then they want a VM. So all the same policies have to apply to that VM. And yeah. then from, a, from an administrative perspective, we're, we're on the point where yeah, the user only needs to run this application once a month. So you bring up their VM, they type up their thing in 30 minutes, and, they, and they're gone. So we don't get to patch it. We don't get to release software to it. We don't well, get to And, and that's it, a big you know? deal for the user, too. If they only launch it once a month, yep. guess what they're getting when they launch it? They're getting all those patches. And they're, and they're getting they're not bounced. They're getting bounced. <laughs> yep. 30 minutes is, is fast. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Yeah. Um, if you do this really well, you get all this information out to your user community. You, you are good with this. You may end up with more Macs than you're prepared to support. Yep. Um, my colleague Chris here, he and I are the, the two uh, Mac admins for you know, 1,300 systems. They are the only two Mac admins. Yeah. We, we have folks at the help desk who know Macs, but they know Macs because we've taught them to know Max. So we, a lot of our job is education. You know, we, you know, any monkey can manage Casper. It's easy. It's so easy. <laughs> um, and, you know, we choose to have two Mac admins because we don't ha want to have one Mac admin. <laughs> yes, the lottery bus. Don't get hit by the lottery bus. 398, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, there's a ton. There's, 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 there's definitely a ton. I mean, th yeah. this is a team of two. There's an entire team of 15, 20 yeah. people who do. And that's just in, in the one group. You have other groups that do networking. You have groups that do infrastructure. Yeah. And they are all Windows, uh, mostly Windows. What? 
Some, Most, some, some it's funny, most of the network folks are, are, are running are Macs, Macs now. Um, but they're still Windows administrators, but like I, me. I tell you, though, you know, we get along great with, with the Windows folks. I mean, you know, we, work, we love working with the Windows folks. So I, you think you had fun on this. Yeah, it was a good time. <laughs> and Eric, Eric, Eric will get me a Mac if I want one. You know, I mean, yeah. You might become a rock. Hopefully iPhone soon. You might also become a rock god, so yes. uh, you know, that, that's a danger. <laughs> it could work out too well for you. So here's where you write things down. Um, I guess technically these are available until June 30th, because this is on my iDisk. <laughs> yes. Mr. Miller. Just a quick question. Sure. How well do the scripts run on, you know, Windows 7 versus Right, so the majority of when we worked on it was for XP, but since I made this one the actual Windows to Windows migration, they came back to me and asked me to write a very similar script to do uh, Windows 7 to Windows 7 or XP to Windows 7 because the, the help desk, believe it or not, and the people who go out to the field, this was something they actually like used. They were like, this is great, why don't we have this for Windows? Because all of our really expensive management products still miss things, and nine lines of VBS gets it, which is weird to me, but <laughs> most of the stuff works in Windows 7. Um, the only thing you have to worry about is UAC escalation for some things. So if you want to look at, if you want to look at a user's certs, you might have to open up the search manager snap-in, and if you want to open up the snap-in, you have to escalate your privileges. So the regular user you know, might get a UAC prompt. You might have to run as administrator. Um, VBS and a lot of packages allow you to compile VBS script to executables. So you just compile it and then you run it as an administrator. But it gets a little complicated in there because once you, Windows is awesome. Once you uh, escalate your UAC, you get another token. You get this administrative token. So, so now your map drives don't show up. You're, you're not that same user anymore. You're, you're an administrative version of that user. So when I did these scripts, in the end, what you, ha what you have to do is, is some of them are in a UAC script and some of them are just a regular script. And the regular script calls the UAC one and it all pipes it out the same, but gets a little, little more, a little more hairy in there. But does, does everybody have like a, or is everybody either a Windows admin or knows a Windows admin that would help them with this stuff? No. Okay. Um, I mean, does, does, is, is any of this stuff scary or, or you know, you're like, oh my God, there's no way I can manage doing this part or, you know. It, we looked at this as just a step at a time when we, when, we were, when we were tackling it. You know, what's one more thing we can do just to make the next one easier? And, you know, this is where we ended up. Yep. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. So there's a couple of us now here in Mac Admin trying to learn ground up. Uh, he has more strength than I do, but that's what we're trying to get. So yeah, the whole thing is we're going to start manually. Mm -hmm. Let's see what we can automate. Yep. Yeah, we're on the same page from there. Yeah. And, and that's the thing. You have to start manual because otherwise you won't know what you need to know. Exactly. Yeah. And you can. Well, yeah. Sky, sky's the limit, really, with, with VBS. I'm, I'm not saying this because I'm a Windows administrator, but VBS is, you could, do, you could do crazy amounts of things, and the WMI, you can do even crazier things, and if you know PowerShell, you can, you can do whatever you want with the Windows box. So, you know, for our stuff, and I see this, I see this stuff as simple, list software install, list map drives, and from a Windows administrator's perspective, you're like, oh, okay, well, that's fine, here you go, but the small stuff in the end ends up being really big to these users, because if Again, I keep coming back to this map drive because this happens. Yeah, oh, yeah. Users just don't know. They have all these links on their desktop for the most important things they do. It's their job. But they don't realize that, yeah, you know, this is a network share somewhere. It has nothing to do with a letter. You know, this is, this is relative, guys. So, do you, have, do you run into people who are switching and later on they're like, oh, this was the worst decision ever? Any, anybody? Remote terminals or VMware 
Yeah, we have it. We have um, we have a terminal server. Um, we're actually one of the th one of the things that I'm hoping will actually help to reduce our Windows VMs is we we're just starting to use um, uh, VMware View, which is essentially hosted virtual machines. So you know I'm getting that VM off of my off of my Mac. It's no longer sucking up half my memory and half my half my processor, and it's being hosted. And I just effectively do an RDC session to it. Yeah. Um, it's, it's actually PC, PC, PC over IP. IP. Yeah. And it's, um, the, the way they do it is they, they dynamically create and destroy the VM. So yeah. from, a, from my perspective, cool, I don't care. I'm not administering another box. And uh, redirected uh, profiles so they still get all the documents, all their settings. Fire VMware, get a VM, use it, close it, it's gone. So I don't, you know, that's fine. It's slick stuff. It's expensive, it but, it's, expensive. but it's slick. Anybody, anybody run into any Mac users or switchers and, and you know, six months later, they're like, this is the worst thing ever? What did what'd you, what'd you run into? What, was, what were the problems? They were very heavy spreadsheet users, a lot of Visual Basic, a lot yep. of shared docs across. That's what our RMIS thing is. That's it's exactly it's Visual what Basic. Is, yeah. 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 So we had a couple people that had given them back, and then we got on the line in Office 2011, and a couple other things like, now I want a Mac again, so we're going to <laughs> Let me get that back. Yeah. Um, how about back here? Which? Yeah. Hey, I'm, so, so is anybody doing anything about training? I mean, what what are we what are we doing for? Hey, I've never touched a Mac before. How do I boot it? What do we do for that? Yeah. <laughs> What is everybody doing? I mean, are you pointing them to Apple's training or? Oh, cool. So you, so you have regular Windows training sessions, regular Mac training sessions, you know? I mean, it's the same if you're going from like XP to Windows 7, you have to train users. Mm -hmm. So when we did our last migration, that was a huge thing. They did the whole entire training session. And is your, are your internal IT folks doing it or you, do you job yeah, it out or? Okay. Does anybody here not know what they're going to do about training? Because we still don't. <laughs> it's still up in the air. It's, they'll they'll it's, learn. That's what we yeah. you'll, you'll, you'll figure it out. You know what, though? We have a, a really, good, um, uh, really good grassroots user community. Uh, we have a, kind of an internal Facebook thing called Cooler, like a water cooler. And there's a Mac user community on that. And I make sure all anybody that I talk to that's a Mac user, I make sure that they join that. Because you can ask a question, and man, you know, five minutes later, you're getting an answer. We also have, you know, a physical APL Mac user group, so an, an actual Apple user group, and we meet monthly. And you know, I'll present it. And, you know, folks will, pre you end users will present it. Hey, here's this cool thing that I do. Here's Quicksilver. You know, something present on Quicksilver. Um, just you know, you get out there, and and especially in a you know, a university research center, they, they love it when you stand up in front of people and talk, you know, so, <laughs> yeah. And, I mean, I, I'll say that's, that's a whole other yeah, that's topic, uh, but so very much related. Um, yeah. The, the halo effect. Yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And we, we do, so, you know, I, I say that, you know, we get users who have no experience with the Mac, but we actually get a lot of users who have a lot of experience with the Mac, either from another company or from yeah, at home, or, and, and when, they, when they hear that, oh, you mean I can, I can get a Mac and I can actually call up the help desk and, and get good answers? I mean, our help desk, 
we've got a great help desk. Um, you know, you can call up and you can you can get answers. Windows, Mac, some Linux, yeah, depending. Yeah. Small yeah. amount. <laughs> Small amount of Linux. Uh, but we got really smart people on the help desk, and and it's a credit to them. You know, we we train them and they get it. And we've got two um, Mac subject matter experts um, who you know they. The ones that the ones that the the general help desk folks can't answer gets channeled to them, but even they are not a hundred percent doing Macs all the time. They're doing Windows stuff also, uh, but you know, we we like our help desk. Um, it's it's funny, you know. You can never have a help desk with enough staff, because you know if it's a bad help desk, one of the reasons is because there's not enough staff. Because you know. Oh, it takes half an hour for them to answer the phones. Well, probably because they don't have enough staff. But if it's a really, really good help desk, guess what happens? People call more. <laughs> they get answers. They're successful. Yep. Oh, I, ha, yeah, how do I, oh, I'll just call the help desk again. <laughs> Surprised so, they got an answer. Yeah. <laughs> but we, you know, we've got a great help desk, so. And they're helpful for our processes, you know. So if you have a help desk, or if you have a build team, or if you have a Windows team, leverage them. You know, tell them what you want to do. Um, sometimes, you, sometimes they may be like, "Oh, yeah, that sounds cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that'd be a really. Yeah, how would I do that script? This was this was Adam. Yeah, you know? that's me. Hey, I <laughs> I knew if I give Adam a challenge. <laughs> I did it. If you give Adam a challenge, he'll but he'll ask for a glass the of milk. The other side of that is expect your Windows people to say no. I mean, yeah. you, you might ask for something and they're just going to be like, no way I'm doing Adam, that. can I get my uh, certs exported? No, you don't do that. Because it, it's all about effort, right? Yes. And of course, Windows administrators, especially where we work, I mean, we're all, we're a Windows shop. I mean, basically, this is why Macs are new. So there's work to do, so. Yes. Okay, yeah, so, so Mac to Mac. Um, and I will tell you what we do um, because there's a lot of different ways to do it. I've been, a, I've been doing Macs at APL since 10.3, um, even before that. Um, and we've been binding our Macs to Active Directory since 10.3. So when we got 10.3, we had that working pretty well, and we were doing a monolithic image or golden master, whatever you want to call it. And I thought, oh, okay, 10.4 came out. Let me try putting the disk in and upgrading. No, no, that didn't, that didn't work. So, you know, 10.5 came out. Oh, let me try. No, it's just, it, it just has never been clean for us to do that full, you know, just an upgrade. I thought 10.7 would be it. And actually hearing some of the uh, stuff this week, I, I, I've got some ideas of that, I, some processes that I might change. But today, I take your Mac. I do a snapshot of it. Um, basically, I, I, we, net, we net boot it. I'm making a disk image off to a file server, so I've got that, that full disk image. I mean, that's actually nice because let's say they just, I don't like 10.7, I want to go back to 10.6. Nobody's done that yet, but I could. I could bring them back. Do that disk image, rebuild them, and then use Migration Assistant to only migrate the users. We do not migrate applications and settings and all the only users. I've had some users say, oh, just build this Mac for me. And then they've done the migration and they've gooned it by migrating everything because it well, just. Yeah. <laughs> so, right. Yeah. Yeah. You're bring. You're bring. Cruft. It's called cruft. You are bringing every time you upgrade, you bring cruft. Do you, do you migrate them once, twice? No. Every time. Every, every time. If the, if they're moving from, if if they're going if they have ten six, or even ten five, and they want to get to ten seven, we nuke and pave. We wipe it. I mean snapshot. That's important. Snapshot first. <laughs> Rebuild it, 
from ground up, migrate to data. And we, we say we migrate um, supported apps. You know, you can't support every single app. And my philosophy is if the user was smart enough to install app ABC on their own, they can install it again. Yeah. Chris, no, no, Chris is, Chris is our, one of our colleagues, so. One of the things I'll interject is that using Casper, and we have a self-service tool, um, Eric has done a fantastic job of the base image has all the basics, Microsoft Office and that sort of thing, all the basics which satisfy probably 9% of the user's needs. If they need something specialized, like in scientific application, we use something called a lab view and MATLAB and that sort of thing. Not everybody, not all the users need that, but a certain few do. We utilize self-service, which the users launch a web-like interface. They log in with the credentials. They say, give this to me. A few minutes later, they get the application. So the user's in effect helping to build their yep. own system with their own customized application. And, really and even our build team, um, they'll look for things. They'll say, oh, well, they had Create a Suite 5 before. And our process is modular. And they'll say, oh, well. Yeah, let's just include that in the in the build because it's you click a button and it's done. So, so you warn them up front that it's not application. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but I like I said, I did, n hearing some of the things like we have a hidden admin account and that gets destroyed when you do a upgrade. And I was like, "Oh, okay. Well, I could I've got a package that creates an admin account, so I could just, you know, do a self-service and have that be, you know, have that be ID 12 or something like that, and you know, just go that way. Um, so, you know, it <laughs> it's going to sound hokey. It's a great time to be a Mac admin, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's fun. We get to play with iPads and iPhones, and and you know. I, I, we he use Casper. Play. He gets to play. I have to I, work. We use Casper, but you know you can use Deploy Studio. You can use all these other tools. There's so many options out there for us. So, so it's 414. One more question. Yeah. It sounds like you guys have similar people where they're just like, I want the form factor. They don't want anything Mac specific other than it's new and it's shiny. And I know you said you don't support the dual boot thing, but have you considered just putting Boot Camp on it, setting it to boot in Windows all the time, and just being like, here you go? <laughs> so there are, um, if, if I know of a user that is going to go that route, you know, I, you know, we'll try to steer them away from that. Because, OK, you can save the lab a couple hundred bucks. Right. It's, not, it's not shiny and everything like that. But there are a couple of truly legitimate cases for, hey, this Mac Pro has 12 cores and I can throw 128 gigs of RAM in it to do all this scientific processing. That's the, that's the most economical machine for that situation. Okay. And yeah, you can throw, you, you know, you make that happen. We did um, do that once yeah. for one group because they were looking to set up a brand new server for their area. And when they did a comparison between a machine with Xeon processors and this number of cores and that much memory, and we want to be really stable, we want to be compact, they built a Dell system on Dell's website, and they built a similar system with almost identical specs. And it was actually cheaper to buy the Mac. So at that point, they're like, yeah, we want you to make the Mac partition exactly five gigs in size. <laughs> and make the boot camp yeah. partition the rest of the disk. And the thing is just a Windows Server 2008 machine because it costs less to buy a Mac. And that's, like Eric said, it's one of the better things is that the Mac hardware used to be the premium. Oh, it's the Rich Boys toy. It's the Rich Boys computer. It's no longer that case. Now it's something which actually gets a lot of work done. And the price comparison is right on the money. And it's no longer comparison Oh, we're comparing a PowerPC processor versus the Intel processor. Right. They're both running the exact same processor. They're both running the exact same drives. They're both running almost identical hardware. It's just a little tweaks here and there. Well, it's 4.15. Um, birds of a feather tonight, if anybody. There's look, looked like a lot of interesting things. Um, fill out your, your forms. Yeah. Give us some, give some that, good feedback. That. Um, that. And uh, we'll... Um, we're actually going to be talking, there's, there'll be a uh, panel discussion on different management tools tomorrow as well. So, Cool. Cool. Thank you. Thank you.